Oh, yes. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويان سورة الأحزاب عين من 56 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما this ayah, as you all know, is a very popular ayah. Most khatib, they recite this ayah on Friday. And this is the ayah of salawat on the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his salawat, his salutations. And also his angels send their salawat, salutations upon the Nabi. We are on the same surah we were last week, surah Ahzab, surah number 33. 33. Surah 33. You have a copy of the Quran that's in front of you, it's page 711. Salawat ala nabi. Allah wa salli ala Muhammad. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. O you who believe... Send your salutations upon him and your blessings and then also send your salams and peace upon him. As we all know, we are all blessed with the Prophet Wasallam as our Nabi. And this ayah speaks volumes about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the Nabi and how the angels see the Nabi and how we should see the Nabi. Along with saying Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhammad out of love and respect for him, uh, as we do, and we should do, and along with the fact that we say our salawat on the Nabi in every salat, right? Every time we do salat, we give our salutations to him, Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad, wa ala ali Muhammad. Up to the end, our salat is not complete until we do so. Uh, these are very common. Uh, known facts in the Ummah that when we are praying in front of Allah, one of the last things we do is we ask Allah to send blessings upon our Nabi. Which shows you the role of the Prophet in our prayer also. As uh, much as we want to say we worship only the Divine, but we do believe in uh, making sure that the Prophet Wasallam is honored and respected and given his due at the end of our prayer. So it's a petition. That after I've done all of my duty to you, I've said Allahu Akbar and Subhanallah and Surah Fatiha and the Qirat and Subhanahu Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhanahu Rabbi Al-A'la and everything else. What, do you, what does the Prophet Wasallam say that Muslims should do? Send Salat upon the Nabi which is a huge theological understanding, which unfortunately sometimes uh, many Muslims overlook, if not ignore, that why do we worship someone uh, who is other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the truth is we don't. Why do we send blessings upon the Nabi? Because Allah wants us to. That's the truth, as this I clarify. Anyway, since this ayah is one of the most important ayat, and every ayah in the Quran is important, we must appreciate what is before this ayah, and what is after this ayah. When we discuss and perhaps study this ayah in isolation, and we want to give a very awe-inspiring and, uh, inshallah, tear-bringing lecture and talk, on this ayah of Salawat al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's wonderful. And it's good for Mawlids. Right. That's part of tafsir. And understanding the whole surah. 
and understanding the context in which this eye is revealed, there's a very definite and definitive social component to this ayah. And what is that? So the ayah before this speaks about preserving the honor and dignity of the mothers of the Prophet ﷺ, of, of, of the ummah, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, that you must uh, remain somewhat aloof from them and you must keep your distance from them. And then later on, Ah, in ayah number 59, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions almost the same thing, except it is for believing women. Right. So keeping a distance from the mothers of the ummah, the wives of the Prophet, and keeping a distance from believing women, envelopes the discussion of Salat al-Nabi. That's the social order. Meaning that if you want Allah, if you want to send blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ, then understand these two ayat also, before this ayah and after this ayah, that if you're going to build a community in which you are going to send salawat, salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ, uh, socially uh, and perhaps even politically, then you must understand that you won't be able to do so until you understand how to behave with women. And if you don't behave with women the way you're supposed to, then you're not sending salawat al nabi You're sending something else, which is what the next ayah says. This is how you do tafsir. Tafsir means you understand each ayah in the place it occurs according to the theme and the context of the whole surah. You can't pick and choose an ayah and isolate it from the whole Qur'an and say this ayah means this and it's a beautiful ayah, which it is, no doubt. And no doubt there is some wisdom in isolating ayat for the sake of exhortation, for the sake of uh, uh, encouraging Muslims to do good and stay away from evil. But when you're doing tafsir, you have to manage every ayah in the context of the surah. So if, if, if you were here last week, you saw the ayat that we discussed had to do with parda, hijab between Muslim men and the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And the ayah that will now come after this ayah, these two ayat, is going to talk about the same thing, that when you are in society, then Muslim women must behave this way, and Muslim men must behave this way. There's the sense of covering that is necessary to understand the institution of Salawat al-Nabi that if you're going to do this you will preserve the sanctity the dignity the honor and the status of the Nabi if you behave like this in society if you do not behave like this in society then the sanctity of the Prophet and the sanctity of Prophethood will be uncovered and you're not doing him any favor by believing this number one and number two, by behaving this way. So, the role of gender relationship or relationships is very critical to understanding the tafsir of this ayah. Is that clear? Otherwise, you'll be taking the Quran piecemeal. That you believe in some uh, of the ayat of the Quran and you disbelieve in others. This side of the Qur'an, Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad, is such a beautiful appeal to my heart, my imagination. I love the Prophet, but then when I go outside, I don't want to behave this way. I want to expose myself. I want to expose my beauty. I want to see how many points I can score with the opposite gender. That, according to this surah, is hypocritical. That, according to this surah, is causing harm and hurt to the Prophet ﷺ, you are destroying his sanctity. He didn't come so that you can do this. He came so that you can preserve not only your dignity, but his dignity. So let's study, or perhaps discuss this ayah, and see, first of all, what it entails. Indeed, Allah and his angels, it was enough that Allah sends salat on the Nabi, but here Allah says, even his angels send salat and salutations upon the Nabi. 
who it is the greatest honor and merit that Allah has given to any person, any of his creation, that they're both engaged in this uh, uh, divine and celestial focus and attention on this one being, one human being, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is an honor, as you can see, is very, very apparent, and uh, we are fortunate enough to be part of the ummah of this Nabi upon whom Allah and his angels send their constant and permanent salutations. And here in the, in, the, in the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word yusallun, which is in the present tense. It's not in the past tense. No, is in the future tense. It is the present tense. That he is continuously doing this. Somebody asks a da'wah worker. A da'wah worker. Who's a da'wah worker? Someone who gives da'wah to an un-Muslim. Okay. Somebody who goes out into the community and says, become Muslim. Yeah. They do exist, by the way. Right. Alhamdulillah. So we met this wonderful da'wah worker. Why are we there studying in India? And uh, we asked him many questions. So he, he would go to Christians and Hindus and everybody else in the Indian community and give da'wah openly and say, become Muslim. Right. So we asked him, what was your greatest moment? He said that I don't know if I had any great moments, but the best moment was when somebody asked me, uh, about uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I said, what is your God doing now? What is your God doing now at this moment? Tell us what he's doing. So he said, uh, for the life of me, I didn't know what to say. I know I'm not an alim. I'm just a da'a worker. Right? It's all impulsive. Then he said, this ayah came. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired this eye into my mind in which Allah says, Inna Allahu malaikatahu yusalluna wa nabi. So I said, God and his angels, what they're doing now is that they're sending blessings upon my nabi. Right? Which is true. It's the absolute haq. So what is God doing now? Yusalluna ala nabi. This is aqeerah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we speak, is sending his salams, his durood, his salutations, and his divine focus is on this Nabi, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why this ayah is so special and so personal to us and so dear to us. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallim wa What is the meaning of Allah sending blessings upon the Nabi? What is the meaning of, Allah, of the angels sending their salutations on the Nabi? What is the meaning of us sending salutations on the Nabi? These are all issues that are discussed and they have to be discussed because they are different. The way Allah sends salat on the Nabi is very different from the way angels do it. And that is very different from the way we do it. And we are asked to do it. So there are three categories of salat on the Nabi that ulama have discussed and they've discussed it very thoroughly uh, in uh, many, many books. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending salat on the Nabi is his eternal divine attention on the Nabi and the mind and the heart and the qalb of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is permanent and this is constant. The way that the angels send their salat and their durood upon the Nabi is that they facilitate everything that is needed to preserve him and his institution of nabuwa. That's what it means when the angels send salat on the Nabi. It means that they facilitate everything in the universe by which uh, the uh, institution of Nabuwa and Muhammad sallallahu himself is going to be preserved. Meaning khatmun Nabuwa. That you're going to preserve the deen of Muhammad sallallahu and you're going to preserve the sanctity of the Nabi and you're going to preserve the ummah of the Nabi. That's how they send salat upon the Nabi. That's the angels. How do we send salat upon the Nabi? And there are two ways. Sallu alayhi is to say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Literally. By the tongue. Without going into any esoteric uh, kind of romantic uh, uh, enchantment with the life of the Prophet and uh, you know everything else. Which is part of your 
academic pursuit and you should do that. You should read the seerah and gain benefit from the seerah and help yourself uh, become more close to the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu and thus to him. But this ayah means that you say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad verbally, literally. You can't escape that. So that's the very definitive meaning of sallu ali. The idea of sallimu taslima is somewhat debated. But how does one now send our salams and peace to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There are two or three ideas that the ulama have referenced. One is, as with Allah Salli ala Muhammad, we say Allah Salli wa Sallim ala Muhammad. You use the word Sallim also. That is one meaning which is good, and we should do that also. Sallim wa Sallim. Another meaning is uh, much more uh, uh, social, and much more proactive, meaning that it has to be manifest in your life. Wa Sallimu wa Taslima. It is uh, another ayah in the Quran. فَلَا وَرَبَّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْدِهِمْ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجْدُوا فِي أُنفُسِمْ حَرَجٌ لِمَّا قَضَيْتُ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا That ayah in Surah Al-Nisa gives us an understanding that سَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا to the Prophet means that you submit and surrender your will and your ideology to what the Prophet Sallallahu will and ideology is. Academically, intellectually, culturally, uh, socially, morally, whatever. In every sense of the word. That's what taslim. Taslim is to surrender and to submit and to acquiesce and to resign and to acknowledge. As the Prophet Sassam himself said, that la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yakun awahu tab'al lima jittu bihi. That he will not believe any, no one will believe until you completely surrender your desire to that which I have brought for you. So I have brought this deen to you. Now you submit and you surrender your ideas to this deen, to what I say. That is Sallimu Taslima. And this can be borne out by the ayah before this and the ayah after this, as I said in my introduction, that the ayah before and the ayah afterwards tells us about a social order social order that comes with Salat al-Nabi, where the Muslims must acknowledge, number one, and then at least acquiesce to the ideals of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, without having too many arguments. Sometimes it's not easy, but that's, that's the goal, right? And that's the test. Who said that practice in Islam is ever easy? Nobody says it's easy. There you will find then a role model in the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. As in the previous story of this surah, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wanted the Nabi to marry the divorced wife of his adopted son, even though the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't want to marry her for social reasons and for potential repercussions against him and the whole institution of Nabuwa. Allah said, وَتَقْشَ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ that you are fearing people, Allah is much more worthy of being feared. Meaning if there's a divine order, then it doesn't matter what the social order is. The divine order will trump, excuse the pun, the social order. Right. The divine order is that this is halal, is halal. So you do it. Because you have to show people this is halal, this is how you manifest Islam. And you submit, salimu, taslima, that you submit to the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, for Muslims, if they truly want an order that is in line with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then along with saying Allahumma Salli Ala Muhammad, they should be willing to at least acquiesce to the order, the social order that the Quran and the Sunnah promote. Without having too many arguments about it against the will, I say, well, this contextual is not contextual. But that doesn't matter. You don't have anything, period. Contextual or contextual? You have nothing. At the moment, does the Ummah have anything to offer to mankind today? In their orders, a few relief agencies. At best, a few welfare institutions. At best, everything else, everybody else in the world is doing. What do you have to offer as a Muslim order to anyone else in the world other than whatever it is you're already doing? 
and that hasn't worked. I'm not saying it hasn't worked. Everybody else in the world will say it hasn't worked. So this ayah, if, if you want, madad from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah's focus to be on us, as the Prophet sallallahu said, man salla alayya maratan sallallahu alayhi ashar. Whoever sends blessings and salutations on me once, Allah sends ten blessings in return. You understand? That the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet is so huge. If we say Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad once, Allah will give us sallallahu alayhi wa ten times. In return. Just for saying that once. Can you imagine this generosity and this fadl and this uh, grace and mercy and rahmah that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we honor our Nabi with our tongues. This by saying with the tongue. If we honor our Nabi by acquiescing to his order, how much salat do you think Allah will send us? Infinite. Right? Once you say Allah will send Muhammad, Allah sends ten blessings. And then one hadith says, he, he will remove ten sins away from us. And the angels, uh, they record that salat and they convey the salat to the Prophet Sallallahu to his Ruh Mubarak. And when we're there in front of the grave, the Prophet Sallallahu actually listens to our salawat and he responds to our salawat and salam himself. But when we say from here, the angels transmit that instantaneously and then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in return sends us ten rewards and send, send us ten means and uh, forms of rahmah and wipes away ten sins from us by simply uttering the salat on the Nabi. So what I'm saying is that if we do much more than that, and we at least, in theory, acknowledge and acquiesce that the order of the Nabi is far more superior, beneficial, than any other order in the world, then how much salat do you think Allah will send us? Enormous. Infinite rather than uh, kind of bickering with each other, fighting with each other, and discussing with each other, this is not good, this is not appropriate, this expedient, and this opportunistic, and this is the strategy, and this is the way we should deal with this. Salli ala nabi. Right? And that is the cultural norm of every Muslim society, that whenever they have a problem, who do they turn to? They turn to the nabi. So you can't turn to the White House. They don't want you. Can you? Let's go knock in on the White House and see. Good luck with that. You should still do it. Make an effort and try. I'm not saying you don't. That's just the way human beings are. But theoretically, ideologically, and more than that, theologically, as part of your aqidah, if you do not believe that the deen you have is far superior than anything else, than anyone else in the world has, then the next time you say, Allah salli ala nabi, count yourself as a munafiq, as a hypocrite. You're not true to your word. Now, will it mean that uh, everybody in the world will become Muslim? No. It means you become Muslim. Stop thinking about others for once in your life. Think about your own Islam and your own Najat. I'm a, am I a Muslim? Am I happy that Allah is sending blessings upon my Nabi? Am I happy that I'm sending blessings upon my Nabi? If I'm happy, then everything else is good. But if I'm not happy, then I'm going to blame everybody else in the world. And then selfishly say that people should do this and people should do that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in this ayah gives us a solution to every social order. Ya ayyuhul ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallam muslima. This is the beauty of this ayah, that not only is it a spiritual ayah, it is a very social ayah. And that's the meaning of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is jami'ah, comprehensive. It gives you a holistic understanding of reality. It gives you a holistic approach to life. And it gives you a holistic approach to hope. This is very key. That we, we cannot abandon hope just yet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us hope. But the hope comes through the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
that when we focus our ideologies upon the theory of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah will send us blessings and many doors will open up. And if you run away from that, all doors will be closed. You'll be confused. The way the Bani Israel were confused for 40 years when they were in the desert. They started somewhere in the morning and when they came back in the evening, they came back to the spot where they started. That sounds kind of uh, familiar. Every time you do something, you go backwards ten steps. Take one step forward, ten steps back. Nothing seems to be happening. It doesn't matter whether you're educated, whether you're rich, whether you have honor, prestige, status. It doesn't matter. If you're Muslim, you're no longer welcome. Now, whether it happens or not, that's the statement is out there. It's not even writings on the wall. It is expressive in your face. So what has gone wrong? What has gone wrong is that the fadl and the salat that comes upon the Nabi is not being distributed to the ummah because the ummah doesn't want it. The ummah is saying Islam is now second class or third class or more than that, Islam is irrelevant. And the social order that Islam promotes is no longer relevant because people will look down upon you if, God forbid, you say there is a gender separation in Islam or there should be very minimal gender relationship in Islam. Which is in the beginning of this, before this ayah, and the end of the ayah. This is the social order that we, we believe in purity of heart and purity of moral conduct and purity of behavior in society. Now, this is a Puritan value, but it's not an impossible value. And it doesn't mean that we're holy in that. It means that we want to be clean. Right? Why are you giving any man the opportunity to see you as a sex symbol? Why are you doing that? And well, everybody looks at me this way. Because I want to be this way. I want to dress up this way. And I want to be decked up this way so that everybody looks at me and they say, okay, this is great. This is freedom. Why are you offering that to society? Or to any other male? And then people complain that male, males are whatever they call them now. You open the door, why do you close the door? Well, it's irrelevant now. But well, that's not the social order of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Neither for his wives nor for the believing women, as you'll see in the next few this is how the Sahaba understood this ayah, that when we go into our spiritual kind of uh, in tra- you know, our trance, which is necessary, by the way, and we have these feelings for the Prophet Wasallam, then these feelings must translate and manifest in our behavior in society that would the Prophet Wasallam condone our behavior today. If he would not, then the next ayah is for us. Not as a warning, but as an education. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ لَعَلَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَعَدَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُحِيمًا And I'm not saying this. This is the tafsir of the Qur'an. Read the Qur'an. The Qur'an is your guidance. It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is wahi to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Indeed, those who hurt Allah and His Rasul, Allah curses them in the dunya and in the akhirah. As I said, it's not my words. These are not my words. And I couldn't have even fathomed how, how to even begin how to, to draw up these ayat in the sequence that the ayat are in. So, as part of our spiritual struggle to be close to Allah and His Rasul, we must be careful that we don't end up hurting Allah and His Rasul in our social behavior, in our social agenda, in whatever strategy we want to devise from here on against whatever is going to come. So we don't want to hurt Allah and His Rasul. If we do that, then uh, God forbid this happens. La anahum Allah. Allah will remove them from his rahmah. La'ana means when Allah removes somebody from his rahmah. How is a person removed from Allah's rahmah by not being Muslim anymore? Al-Aman al 
And ayyadu billah, may Allah save us and protect us and our children and our grandchildren and everybody else that comes afterwards. The greatest lana and punishment is that people, meaning Muslims, are removed from Islam. It's a disaster. It's a cancer. It is greater than death. Because that means permanently we can't say too much about Allah's rahmah for this person. And what are we doing to make sure that no one leaves the deen? We say, well, perhaps a little bit of haram is good. We'll tolerate this behavior and not this behavior. Oh, that's okay. They have their own lives. That's our attitude. By acquiescing to the norm in Muslim communities, the Muslim communities do this, and Muslim communities do that, and sometimes you actually participate in the norm. Very freely, and sometimes very happily. So when the Ummah stops behaving like Muslim, that is a sign of this ayah, that Allah is cursing them. Cursing doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sits there on his throne, and he says, Lanatullah, Lanati, Lanati. It means that you are removed from the tawfiq of becoming close to Allah and closer to the paradigm of the Prophet. That's what it means. You are no longer in the field of Salat al Nabi, you're outside of the field of Salat and blessings upon the Nabi. And we must do everything to ensure that this doesn't happen and not acquiesce or justify the sin in people. One is that people commit sin. Nobody is holy in that and say, I don't commit sin. Everybody commits sin. May Allah forgive us all and save us from sin and give us all tawfiq to do what is good. But when somebody does and it's now public or if it's in vogue, it's the style, it's the norm, it's the thing, it's cool right? to be that way then you must condemn it. If you condemn it, that lana will not come to you. If you don't condemn it and you acquiesce, that lana will come to you. Right? Just as other infectious diseases will come to you. Allergies come to you. Never mind diseases. Allergies come to you. So you are not immune from that. Right? And we must appreciate that salawat al nabi is part of this uh, ever- lasting struggle in the Muslim Ummah that we want to preserve the sanctity of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when we are here as Muslims we are representing him. Are we not? When we say we are Muslim we are representing the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how does one represent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? By behaving in such a way that shows people we are Muslim not by behaving in such a way that we are like you You understand the difference? When you are kind to your neighbor, as I've said this before to some of you, then you are kind to your neighbor because it is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You are not kind to your neighbor because you are like your neighbor. There's a difference. Right? So when you engage with your neighbors, then you engage with the rules of engagement, and that is this separation between genders. There's a modesty. There's some haya and sharam that's involved. Even when you expose yourself as Muslims, you don't just dive into the deep end. Everything's now hunky-dory. It doesn't work that way. And it should not work that way. Why? Because we will be hurting the image of the Prophet Wasallam that your leader and your Nabi, who is Khatim al Nabi, the last of all Anbiya, alayhi salam, he allows you to dress this way, behave this way, and then engage this way, and entertain each other this way. That's how you hurt Allah. And that's how you hurt the Rasul. By saying, I have a top-notch job, MashaAllah, give us all barakah and ajr, and uh, keep us and preserve us. I'm not saying that's bad. What I'm saying is that when you go there, and now, okay, post 9-11, every Muslim has been exposed as a Muslim, whether they like it or not. And the president-elect has made sure that you're exposed. Right? You can't hide from that. You are who you are. So suck it up and acknowledge that you are who you are. And then when you behave with people, you behave according to the image and the role model the Prophet ﷺ.
Can you imagine how women would feel if you told them that we don't see you as a sex object? Would they feel more comfortable that way? Or would they feel more comfortable if you just engaged and you became like them to show that you're normal? No. I'm telling you that they would still feel more comfortable with you if you said, hey, wait a minute. My Nabi and my Deen, my religion says, I should lay off here. I should be guarded here. They'll see your modesty. They'll see your haya. They'll see your sharam. And they will say, good. Just as when you are kind to your neighbor because Muhammad وسلم, wants you to be kind to your neighbor, they will see your ethics and manners that you're not after them. So here, this, this ayah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ is very, very penetrating. And we should accept this as not a warning, but a good sign for us to stay away from the filth that society wants us to accept, acknowledge, and promote. And we can't jump onto that bandwagon because we want to be normal and seen as normal in the eyes of others. Here, fit dunya wal akhirah. Not only in the, the akhirah, it's also in the dunya, as is very apparent, unfortunately. And Allah has prepared for them a very, very disgracing, humiliating punishment. Meaning, be careful. Yeah. All our skills and talents and our abilities on one side and the ability of us to represent Muhammad Sallallahu on the other side uh, is, is, they're not equal. And we must appreciate Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala's fadl on us. And when we say Allah Salli ala Nabi, we should do the second part, Sallimu Taslima, uh, completely acquiesce to his role model and to the paradigm that he brings us and to other human beings. If we do this, Allah's fadl is with us also. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَا اكْتَسَبُوا فَقَدِ احْتَمَلُوا بُهْتَانَ وَإِثْمُبِينَ And this will trickle down into the Muslim community society also that those who hurt believing men and believing women without anything that they have earned then indeed they will be carrying and be responsible for huge accusation and a very open sin meaning your actions will come back to haunt other Muslims that's what this ayah means. Don't assume that if you commit a sin, it won't come back to hurt you, your family, your children, anybody else in your family, or at least the Muslim community, because it will. You can't afford to be that aloof from the community that my sin is with me. It doesn't work that way. Sin and good deeds, they are, what do you call, um, contagious. Right? They do have an effect on you, on the surroundings around you. And this is something that the Muslim Ummah has always appreciated. That They used to say that if you do your Salat properly, the Salat will have effect on you, and it will have effect on the surroundings around you. Just your Salat. And if you do your Salat in the wrong way, or uh, in a way that shows that you're not mindful of who it is you are praying for and praying in front of, then that will have an adverse effect on you and the surroundings around you. That was the ideal in the Muslim mind. And this was established, well, God knows that, a millennium, a millennium ago. The Sufis always spoke about this. They always spoke about that your action is going to have an impact on you and the surroundings around you, whether somebody is there or not. And if somebody is there, it will have an impact on you. This is how... We used to be that we, we always believed that we are not alone on this ship. The ship has how many? A billion people on it. A billion. Not just us in the USA. We're part of the billion. Now, geographically, we're disconnected. Ideologically, we're disconnected. And we think culturally we're disconnected. That, that doesn't matter. Islamically, we're all connected. We're all part of this great ship. And this ship continues, started from the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and that extends until the Day of Judgment. So more than a billion. Whoever came from Abu Bakr until the last day, they're all part of this ship, and you have influence on each other. This way and that way, chronologically. 
and also physically and geographically. It doesn't matter. Right? This sense of isolationism in the Muslim Ummah, that somehow we are isolated from others okay, in our time and in our space, is why we don't understand ayat like this. How does one hurt believing men and believing women? Well, I'm doing my you know, usual, which most of us do, mashallah. But there are some things that I do, and only I know that I do, and I think I'll get away with it. Well, you may get away with it, Allah, inshallah, keep, keep, keep farda, uh, and uh, all, all, our, all our skeletons in the closet forever, and not reveal them nor the, neither in this world nor the hereafter. But when you do the deed, remember this ayah. When you do the deed, or you want to do the deed, remember this ayah. This is what Allah is saying. I'm not saying this. That those who hurt believing men and believing women by not behaving according to the social order of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and not sending salawat on the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what does Allah say? That they will carry a huge burden and an open sin. You're not isolated. It doesn't matter how big you think you are, how small you think you are, you are part of the Ummah, which is why uh, the uh, angels send salat on the Nabi because the angels want to corral all Muslims around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? On the Day of Judgment, who will be allowed to enter Jannah first? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And who will enter Jannah the last? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, that, that, you say that. We have, mashallah, kind people, generous people, philanthropists in the world. Beat that for philanthropy. Allah says, Ya Muhammad, udkhul, enter Jannah. The Prophet said, no. Why? Because I'm not entering until the last person of my ummah enters Jannah. Now that's sacrifice. Meaning his work is not done yet. And that's the meaning of the angels sending salat on the Nabi. That the angels want to make sure that everyone who's a believer enters Jannah. So they're worried about you and others. Why aren't you worried about you and others? I mean, there should be some reciprocation, I hope. Right? That the angels who carry the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, الَّذِينَ يَحْمِلُونَ الْعَرْشُ مِنْ حَوْلُهُ etc. That ayah. That the angels make dua for every believer and they seek forgiveness for every believer and they make dua that Allah forgives every believer and allows every believer to enter Jannah. And then the believer says, I don't care what I do. As long as it doesn't impact and affect anybody else, I'm fine with it. But it does. Everything you do impacts you, your family, your children, your parents, your relatives, your siblings, your community, the people around you. And if it doesn't do that, it affects people on the other side of the world. Whether you know it or not, we're all connected. We are like one body. The Prophet ﷺ described the believers as what? كَمَثَلِ الْجَسَدِ الْغَاحِدِ As one body. And in one body, if something happens to the toe, that means something's happening in the head. And vice versa. Right? Are you disconnected? Or do you have one body? So if the Muslims see themselves as one body, they will represent the one being who is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and continue sending salutations on him as part of this ayah, this instruction that we should all send salutations on the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the social order is of the, the most important uh, from these ayat that we should not end up hurting ourselves. In the ladina yudun al mu'minina wal mu'minat bi'ghayri maktasibu without the believers even doing anything. Meaning that if you are a bad person and your neighbor is a good person, then you are hurting your neighbor despite him being a good person. That what kind of injustice is that? It's the same thing. That if there's a disease or an illness or there's a kind of deficiency in one part of your body, the whole body will suffer. See yourselves as whole and complete and holistic. Don't see yourselves as independent cells. Again, excuse the pun. Right? As independent beings. 
I'm independent with my Najat, my Sahib. No, it doesn't work that way. The Quran has never said that. The Hadith never says that. And these ayat don't say that. You are part of the whole Ummah. Whether or not you agree with the Ummah, whether or not you even like the Ummah. Right? The other point is that we, we hate each other, unfortunately. And no one's good enough for us. Anything a Muslim does is oh, mediocre, it's a mediocre, and it's not worth pursuing, and every time there's anything that's going on in the community is useless and futile. And if that's the order of the brain in the Ummah, that the brain now says, my body is useless, then the body becomes useless. You can't have that attitude. Why? Because our Nabi will not have that attitude for us on the Day of Judgment when he says, I won't enter Jannah until the last person enters with me. Follow the Nabi. Don't follow your selfish pride. And look at your accomplishments. I've made it big, and they don't know anything about this. Why don't you help them? Well, it's boring. Why is too much work? Try the work of the Nabi on the Day of Judgment when the, that, that day is 50,000 years long. And he's going to wait until you enter Jannah. Is it? That the angels send Salat on the Nabi. This is what it means. That they do everything to make sure that the Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam is preserved and the sanctity of the Ummah is, is, is maintained and that every believer who is with Muhammad Wasallam is in Allah's fadl the place we call Jannah. That is the order of Salat of the angels on the Nabi. And when Allah says, Ya Yuhladina Amin Sallu Alayhi wa Sallim Taslima, He wants us to reciprocate and say, we are going to do the same thing. We are going to take this one whole body of Muslims into Jannah with us. Are we going to go into Jannah alone? What are you going to do in a huge, huge universe alone? You're going to be a loner in Jannah? You can afford to be a loner here and say, nobody's good enough for me. Can you be a loner in Jannah? No, it's not going to work. You're going to have everybody there with you as one whole community. Ashab al-Jannah, the companions of Jannah, one big community. So anyway, <clears throat> this is how we see now the, 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 the backdrop that the ayah before this speaks about a certain way to behave with the Wives of the Prophet Sallallahu and the ayah after it now speaks about how Muslim women and men should behave in society. Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu, kul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisail mu'minina yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihinna thalika adna an yu'arafna fala yudayn wa kaan Allah ghafur rahim. The point is you should not be hurt. Muslim women nor Muslim men should be hurt in any way, shape or form in the way they dress outside of the house. Right? Now, hurt it doesn't mean necessarily physical harm or a sexual assault or a sexual offense, God forbid. It also means hurt in the spiritual sense, in the intellectual sense, that when you go about displaying your beauty this way or that way, then you will be hurt. You will be hurt. In the very least, spiritually. In the very least, ethically and morally. And on more than one occasion, even physically. You'll be hurt. Invariably. Undoubtedly, because that is what men do. Can you say men don't do that? It doesn't matter whether you're Muslim or black or white or brown. It doesn't matter whether you're supremacist or whether you're the angel of all human beings. You, if you are a man and there's a woman in front of you all dressed up, what are you going to do? Tell me. Even if you're Yusuf in Islam, what are you going to do? I'm not, I'm not going to exonerate myself, even though I have the taqwa of Yusuf. I'm not going to say, it doesn't matter to me. So here the Quran says, don't hurt yourselves. O oh, Nabi. Yeah. This is an address to the Nabi. Say to your wives and to your daughters and say to the believing women that they should bring close to them their janabib, their covering, because this is much clearer and much more appropriate in as far as them being recognized as an object of desire. I'm including that in the translation, although it's not in the Quran, 
so that you understand what the Quran is saying. فَلَا يُؤْذَيْنَ Unless you will not be hurt. Unless you might be hurt. If you do this, you will not be hurt. And if you don't do this, you will be hurt. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ رَحِيمًا Allah is all-forgiving and all-merciful. So here the social order for those who send salat al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is that they don't hurt themselves. And they don't promote a life and a lifestyle that says that we want you to hurt us. Then obviously you are the target of ridicule if you say this is good. Now, now whatever the fiqh of this ayah is, I'm not discussing that. I'm saying that the theory of this ayah is that if you give a man a bone, he's going to ask for more. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, what do you do? Well, it's about men. It's about men and women. That don't hurt yourselves. Don't concede to an order that's going to give you grief. Does that mean everybody now has to wear the burqa? I'm saying that to be appropriate in your dress code. Be mindful that uh, no one is uh, that pure that they will not look at you. Neither male nor female. The female also wants to be attracted, right? They don't want to be rejected or denied. They, they want attention. That's why perhaps some of them dress that way. Some of them. Not all of them. And men always want attention. That's how they are. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that before you get hurt in this whirlwind of the sexual revolution that comes with every society, especially a free society, especially post-60s, that before you get there, make sure you don't commit suicide in the process. Because if you do that, what's going to happen? Both your male child And your female child will want to frequent places where this occurs all the time. And that will become part of their DNA. And when that becomes part of their DNA, they will fool you and they will cheat behind you. And sometimes they'll even cheat behind the husbands and behind the wives. Because of this lack of understanding of the social order of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if you want to keep the Muslim Ummah intact, you must keep the family intact first. You must keep the husband and wife together first. You must keep the child and the parent together first. You must keep the siblings together first. And this is the way to do it. Now, this is very alien to the 21st century non-Muslim and also very alien and repulsive to the 21st century Muslim. How dare you say that? I'm not saying that. This is the Quran that's saying that. This was revealed 1400 years ago. Not my words. Read the Quran. The Quran is a book of guidance. So guide yourselves through the Quran, with the Quran, and through the Quran. This is your salvation. This is your social order. Well, I say it's not relevant anymore. SubhanAllah, mashallah. What's relevant now? Atheism. Is atheism re- relevant? Liberal values are relevant now. You agree with them? Do you? That you're using this argument is no longer relevant. People won't like you if you say this. Well, will people love you if, God forbid, a Muslim says, I'm no longer a Muslim? But if someone says, I no longer believe in a decent living and a good, clean living, is that what you're saying? That's not the way for us to behave and to think. The way for us to behave and to think is that we must preserve ourselves first. We can't expect others to help us or we shouldn't jump onto the bandwagon of others or hitchhike with others when others have very, very opposing values to us. We can seek their support. But should we say this is the only way? No. We have our own original values that came with the Quran and Sunnah, that came with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And once we believe in the institution of Salat al Nabi, then we must submit acquiesce to the role model that is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and say, this is the way forward. Do you want Muslims to be miserable? No. Do you want Muslims to commit sin? No. 
So you can't have your cake and eat it. It's no longer a choice. The social order at the moment is totally against Islam. That is a fact. It's not a fact, it's a fact. Now, the way to come to terms with this is by coming to terms with this order that sends Salat on the Nabi. Because when we send Salat on the Nabi once, Allah sends Salat upon us ten times. Just open the door. We haven't opened that door yet. We've closed that door. In fact, we've sheltered us ourselves from that whole building institution in such a way that even if we are to go outside in the rain, the raindrop won't touch us. So when we say, Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, open the doors of our hearts, our minds, our ideologies, that they reflect who is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at least in principle. I'm not saying that you will all become Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani today. If you do, that's great. That's a last problem. I don't mind. Make God, I become that way. I don't mind. At least in theory, in your understanding of who you are, what you are, where you are, you must appreciate that you are a representative of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is what you need to come to terms with. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would never condone your behavior, period. Can we come to terms with that? Yes. We can. Do we want to? Maybe, maybe not. But that's the struggle. And the struggle is real. I'm not saying it's easy. Because we're so used to the good times. Pre-9-11 times. I'm referring to those. Uh, the good times. Post-9-11, we a bit guarded after 9-11. Then we lost our way again. And now, this time, Allah is saying, wake up. Yeah. These warnings come from the divine for us to wake up. Not that we go back to sleep. And in our slumber, and say, we can't do anything, we shouldn't do anything. We are now defeatists and we are the most bichari, miskeen, uh, faqeer people on the earth. Which is what you are if you believe that way. If you don't believe that, you say, no, I am... An ummah, a part of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he is the best human being. Period. Maintain your pride and honor and your dignity, and saying we are representatives of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, this may not appeal immediately to those in front of you, those whom you work for, those whom with you work, those whom you work with, and even your neighbors. But then look at Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Look at this whole surah. It's all about trials and tribulations. It's not about uh, having a nice life. It's, it's about trials and tribulations. We, we are already accustomed to trials and tribulations in our daily work. When we wake up 5 o'clock in the morning, go to work, come back at 7 or 8, and you know sometimes have a good meal, sometimes not so good meal, but you go to sleep and you do the whole thing again. For 5 days, some of it 6 days. We're, we're ready for that kind of work. Just transfer that mentality and approach to this. Are we ready for this kind of work? Yes. All we have to say is yes. That's what we do. We say yes. We are ready for this, except that we need to follow the instructions of the Prophet ﷺ and the Qur'an so that we don't end up hurting ourselves. Allah and His Rasul, they will never want us to hurt ourselves. But are you they? The Prophet doesn't want any Muslim woman to be hurt. The Prophet doesn't want any Muslim believer uh, and a man to be hurt. That is not how they are. They send salawat upon the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we send salawat upon the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that there is rahmah and this rahmah must now be exposed. If it's not exposed in Muslims, then how is it going to be exposed in non-Muslims? If we close the door and say, now, this is not the time for Islam, say, this is the best time for Islam. This is the best time to expose who you are, what you are, what you stand for. And if you believe this, then this country has afforded success to those who stand up for what they believe in. And history is a proof of that. I'm not going to tell you how to be more American, less American. But I'm certainly going to tell you how to be Muslim. So even with that standard, you should be standing up for who you are, what you are, without hurting yourself. In the process, follow the sunnah. Don't follow your nafs and your desires and don't follow your ideas in such a way that you're going to end up hurting the institution of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
because you may just be deprived from his intercession shafa on the day of judgment. You don't want that to happen, trust me. Allah save us all and protect us all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save and preserve the institution of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his nabuwa and the khatm nabuwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve us and our children, grandchildren until the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to become better Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow everybody else around us to become Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects our uh, uh, he protects our honor and dignity, our wealth and our pride and our Islam and our deen here in this country and every country in the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect Muslims throughout the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the doors of his rahmah for everybody in this country, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayr khalq Muhammad wa ali wa sahabi ajma'in. Bi rahmatika ya 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 rahmatika 